Welcome to City and State. Uh, in a few weeks, we are going to be kicking off our annual borough series, and this year the feature uh, of the of the borough series is the future of each borough. Um, we're starting in Brooklyn, and we wanted to bring in uh, someone who knows Brooklyn as well as anyone. Carlos Cesar is the president of the Chamber of Commerce, president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce in Brooklyn, and. Uh, you know, this this uh, series we're doing is going to look a lot at the future, a lot of like what's growing, what's uh, what can be done in each borough to to make it better. And we have a lot of proposals that are coming out um, from the mayor about how ways to kind of grow the city in a different way that maybe has been happening right. in the past. Specifically, the zoning uh, initiatives that just got passed in the city council. Your thoughts on those zoning issues? I know you are supporting the, the, the plans the mayor put forward. Why do you think this is going to help the world? Sure. So uh, we were, I think, one of the earliest advocates of that plan. It's very simple. When government uh, tries to spur economic development in places like East New York or other places across the city, I use East New York because that's one of their pilots, <clears throat> I think we should all embrace it because there's already been some good things happening in East New York over the last few years, but this is a real game changer for communities like East New York in every borough across the city. Um, and I think when you talk about economic development, building up neighborhoods, creating jobs, obviously creating affordable housing. Uh, you know, people said to me, well, why is a business advocacy group supporting or getting so involved in something that's creating affordable housing? Well, the people who live in that housing are people who own businesses in Brooklyn or work in businesses in Brooklyn. We want to keep them here. One of the complaints we get all the time from our businesses is, my employees cannot afford to live in the neighborhoods where we have our business. And you don't want to see a continuing exodus of lower and middle income New Yorkers. You want to see them thriving in the boroughs. I think one of the concerns <laughs> of the plan, or at least the, the opposition that was raised, is, is this idea that you know, this plan, kind of all the plans, you know, get back to this idea of gentrification and this fear of gentrification. Um, obviously, Brooklyn is kind of ground, you know, zero for that. So that's probably a bad term to use, but it's right. the center of it's the yeah. center of kind of this the debate and fight. A lot of a lot of you know public uh, talk from like Spike Lee and others about how gentrification is a bad thing to some level. As you as you view people who are skeptical of this plan because of the gentrification, what do, what do you tell them to kind of? Convince I mean, I them? tell them very simply. People will invest a lot of money to make your community better. If you live in these neighborhoods, you're going to see new schools, you're going to see new open space, you're going to see boulevards rebuilt with trees and better lighting and infrastructure repairs. And you, if you live in these communities, will have an option to get one of these new units. I think that's a wonderful thing. And then there are lots of people who want to stay in Brooklyn. They can't afford it. They will live in places like this. It's, it's a win-win for everyone. Okay. Another uh, initiative you guys have been talking about, and then uh, you've organized a lot of lawmakers out of Albany and a lot of lawmakers in Brooklyn to push for, is the uh, Express F train service. Um, to expand out and, and have a quicker commute for people who live in Coney Island, those types of neighborhoods that are far away from uh, Manhattan. A lot of people commuting in for the jobs, but they, have, they spend a lot of time doing it. Um, why is that so important? And, and is this, you know, why are you targeting just that specific train? Do you feel like there's maybe a larger overhaul that maybe could be discussed? I mean, in the I think, the, first of all, I got to thank Councilman David Greenfield, who's been really pushing this so hard. Um, this is a no brainer. These tracks exist. Mm -hmm. There used to be express F train service years ago when I was a kid in the 80s out to Coney Island. This is a simple no-brainer that the MTA could do without building new tracks, without digging tunnels, without changing things. Um, it's very simple. Keep the F local, make it every stop as it does today, and then add an express. Do five or six stops, let people get across Brooklyn in a shorter amount of time than it does to get to Westchester. It's crazy that you can get from Midtown Manhattan to Westchester County quicker than you can get on an F train to Coney Island. Let's do something about it. And this is easy. We're not saying build a new tunnel. We're saying just come on, let's let's restore service that was there. Do you think this is indicative kind of the larger conversation that we've had about Brooklyn in the past about how, you know, there's to some level and inequality in certain neighborhoods. Certain neighborhoods get more of uh, attention than others, and from maybe from the MTA, but other from other organizations it's, as well. It's very simple. The further you go out of downtown Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, the more hurt you are in terms of commute. The R train has been a disaster forever. 
Uh, the N train is undergoing major rehabilitation. The F train, we can't get an, an F express. The L train, they're talking about potential shutting it down for years. The M train, now we just heard in northern Brooklyn, is going to be stopped for weeks and weeks. Come on, it's like southern Brooklyn, northern Brooklyn. You continue to beat us up. I'm a southern Brooklyn guy. I mean, enough is enough. Let's focus the MTA on the boroughs. It's very simple. Infrastructure needs in these communities is real. Do you think that that's, um, there's a larger, I guess, argument for this to say that this is, these are also the areas that are going to be growing in the future? That maybe like, not to say downtown grows, Brooklyn's gonna, not going to continue to grow, but there is much more of a, an opportunity to grow in these other areas if you had better transportation. Uh, you, would, you would have, look, you have a D train that runs express. We should be seeing development all across the D train corridor. But if you don't make sure it runs, developers and the construction industry won't be coming out there. It's the same on every line that I just talked about. Coney Island, look, we've all been talking about Coney Island for decades. We are poised to see incredible construction, job growth, development in Coney Island. But if it takes an hour and a half from Midtown to get to Stillwell Avenue on Coney Island, people are not going to move there. People, tourists are not going to go there. Commuters are going to choose to live somewhere else. Um, so it's crazy. I think the one good thing is, uh, or two good things I think the mayor has done, which we're very excited about, is the ferry service. So that's exciting. There will be ferry service across Brooklyn. Um, Bay Ridge, for example, we lobbied hard for for years. Very excited to see that happening. Would love to see a stop in Coney Island. So I'm hoping as the plan evolves, there will be a full service ferry terminal in Coney Island. Obviously, you have an ocean and a bay. What better place? Um, and then the BQX, the, the famous streetcar you've been yes, hearing yes. about. Truly transformative, visionary project for Brooklyn and Queens. will connect an entire innovative corridor from Sunset Park at the Brooklyn Army Terminal up to Queens, Long Island City, and Astoria and bring together Red Hook and Sunset Park and Dumbo and all these places. Um, these are the things we should be looking at for the future. And by the way, building a BQX not just will help commuters, but imagine the number of jobs, the number of jobs in construction, good paying jobs, the number of community jobs, the number of local jobs, the number of MWBE jobs. It, it, it's mind boggling what this will do. It will just create the greatest, I think, innovative corridor in America. On the BQX, I mean, I, obviously it seems to be widely uh, kind of praised, I mean, all across kind of all sectors to some level. The cost seems to be, you know, not, not too expensive with the idea that by the added value that comes from it will pay for it. Um, but my question is, is, is this, is, is there, is, is it where we should be investing, I guess, money to some level? Because, you know, you could say to some, to some, you know, some people could say that, like, you're investing in an area that's already growing, where you could be investing in areas maybe that do where you could do grow well, more. I, I disagree, because you're investing in an area that can have hundreds of thousands of jobs over the next 20, 30 years. Uh, between all of the buildings in Sunset Park, from the Army Terminal to Industry City to Liberty View, into Red Hook, the Navy Yard, downtown Brooklyn, uh, the whole Williamsburg waterfront, and then up to Queens. Think about the potential, the people who live there, um, the life-changing experience for someone who lives in the Red Hook houses. The public housing, which has, I think the, the estimates are 40 or 50,000 residents along this proposed route, will now actually have ways to get to jobs in other places that don't take them two to three hours a day. This is a revolutionary idea. The same way, by the way, Mayor Bloomberg had a revolutionary idea when he said we're building a, an extension to the 7 train. Well, now Mayor de Blasio is saying we're looking at the next neighborhoods, and here we're knitting together a dozen neighborhoods. It's, it's very exciting. I wanted to, before I let you go, talk a little bit about the, the budget because it's going on right now, specifically the minimum wage push, which I know you guys have not taken a stance on. You have some members that are for it, some members that are against it. Obviously, you're watching it very closely. Yeah. Um, what, what's your sense? Do you feel like this is something that uh, is going to happen or that you guys are kind of preparing your members to... So, to... It's, so it's interesting. I think from, from the last panel I was on yeah. with City and State, uh, we did a survey. We, we talked to members. We surveyed our members and the majority support the minimum wage increase. Um, the question is, 
And I've said always I personally support it, even before the chamber yes. took a position of generally supporting it. The question is, when does it come in? Mm -hmm. So I think we all kind of agree it should be $15, but should it happen in a year or two? Probably not. It does need a longer phase in. And I think the one thing we heard from our members is, yes, the majority support $15. However, the majority also say we need a longer phase and it cannot just be a year or two from now. Is also there maybe a sense amongst your members of like there, there needs to be to some level some give back to small businesses Absolutely. as well? Because I think it is what, what I've heard from a lot of businesses, it's not necessarily that a $15 minimum wage is a problem. It's, it's a trickle of little things over years and years that, that kind of hurt businesses. Correct. So when you add paid sick leave, mm -hmm. minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, what are we giving to the businesses? So are we gonna give them something to help them with their rent? Are we gonna give them something to reduce operating costs, lower tax rates, uh, incentives to hire employees, um, incentives to move into communities that need businesses? I mean, it goes on and on. So there's gotta now be a discussion that we all in the business community need to frame what will government do to help the businesses grow. I think the governor was good with his reduction in, in certain income taxes and business taxes, very important, but there's a lot more that we need to do. Okay. Well, we're running out of time, but I just want to give you a chance to talk about anything that you guys have come up with the Chamber of Commerce, anything you wanted to promote. I know you have a couple of events going on, the yeah, Brooklyn we, Designs. Uh, this is our, our busy, busy season. I think I think our biggest thing right now is Brooklyn Designs. Mm -hmm. So it will be one of the hottest shows in Greenpoint that will bring together only Brooklyn-made makers of furniture, tables, lighting, uh, anything home decorating. Uh, this is real. This is real Brooklyn. These are real employers. These are people trying to create jobs in Brooklyn, and we're here to showcase them. Last year, we had over 10,000 people visit. Uh, it will be uh, the weekend of May 6th in Greenpoint. You'll hear more about it as the, the weeks ahead. And we'll link to some information about that on absolutely, our website. Absolutely, absolutely. iBrooklyn.com. Great. Carlos Sir, President and CEO of the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, thank you very much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me.